We are continuing our look at the book of Titus this morning. You can turn to chapter 2 with me. Before we get there, I just want to ask a couple of questions just to have us considering uh, something as we work through this, this great text. It's a great text of really deep theology, but with a very, it's a very grounded theology. And I want to ask us, what is our hope? And I want you to think beyond the Sunday school answer, even though the Sunday school answer is 100% correct. Sunday school answer is Jesus, always, right? That's the safe answer to a Christian question. And that's a safe answer for this. We do place our hope in trust in Christ and Christ alone. But I think I want us to dig a little deeper than that and really ask yourself the hard questions of, in life, is that truly where your hope is when you're going through trials and tribulations? Is that what you're holding on to? Whether it be economic trial or social trial, you know, the Christian life doesn't guarantee a free ride through any of the various trials that can come against us. And I know in my own life, I have sometimes had to be brought up very short by the Lord that he has exposed to me ways in which I'm not trusting in him. And so uh, I think you're going to see why I'm, I'm starting with that. We'll finish up with, with an appeal to that as well. Just by way of reminder, Pastor Andrew ta uh, taught from the first 10 verses of chapter 2, and that continued this push, an ethical push, which is, runs through the book of Titus. There is an appeal to godliness on, at many points, and in spite of the fact that Cretans are these uh, infamous, infamous uh, immoral culture. It's not the culture that, that Paul addresses. He actually first makes sure the church is in order by making sure there are elders over all of these young churches. Then he ensures that there is good teaching in each of these churches. And then he's talking about abiding to that teaching as well. And then finally, by about verse 10 of chapter 2, there's a hint at external ministry, and it reads like this. Finally, by verse 10, we, we see the showing of all good faith. And why? So that in everything, they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. And I have been thinking about that uh, quite a bit this week because it's quite a remarkable statement. To think that the very gospel of God can be adorned uh, we think of adornment as something uh, like dressing ourselves up in a way that we're not so that we'll uh, draw attention to ourselves, right? We know from Paul's teaching in the rest of Scripture that that's, he's not calling the gospel insufficient in itself. But clearly, because God's word is true and Paul writes it, there's a way in which our behaving and, and can align with our believing and in such a way that it draws attention to the gospel in a helpful and an appropriate way. And that's what we're really trying to drive at. We've titled this series Gospel Thinking for uh, Gospel Living. Because we want our living to align with the gospel, not merely so that we're good people or that we can feel good about ourselves in a religious sense. It really is truly for the glory of God and the good of our public witness that our living aligns with our thinking, with our believing. All right, so let's turn to our text. This is God's word. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Well, what we can see straight away is indeed that God's grace is what takes center stage here. Um, we've moved away from this uh, exhortation in, in Christian ethics that uh, covered old and young, male and female, masters and servants. So in, in, 
In other words, kind of no one is left uncovered by that, at this call to an ethical behavior. But now we are going to find what is the basis, what is the motivation, what is the fuel for that ethical behavior. If all we do is trade in, in a way, our proper Christian faith for another form of a man's religion through which we are going to make ourselves right to God, then we're no further ahead ourselves and we're no public witness. And so let's see what God's word says about God's grace. Well, straight away in verse 11, we see that God's grace, God's grace appears. God's grace appears. And I want us to consider the nature of the grace and what the nature of this appearing is. We know a simple definition for God's grace is that it's his unmerited favor toward us. That's a good definition, and there's nothing wrong in itself. I don't think it's a complete definition, and I think we'll see that unpacked a little bit today. But it is a good place to start, and so let's think about that even, that it's God's unmerited favor. The basis of of this unmerited favor is in God and rooted in God and God alone. It's his gracious character and disposition toward us. Sometimes we talk about God being for us. That's his basic inclination toward you. He's for you, not against you. One theologian, I think, helpfully calls it uh, self-motived. Self-motived. That's God's grace is self-motived. All that means is that the, the motivation for God's grace resides in himself and himself alone. So in other words, he's not looking externally. He doesn't look to you this morning and look at either your performance or your potential or your needs and say, I'm going to give you more or less grace today based upon that. His grace toward you is self-motive because he is grace. We talk about God being, uh, God is love. Well, he's not love because he does loving things. He's love because he is love in essence. And so God is grace the very essence of grace, and it flows out of him naturally and willingly, and he loves to give it lavishly to us. You know, frequently, uh, people in the church will tell us as leadership they're thankful when we bring um, notice of needs to you. It could be needs within the church, a financial need, or it could be a need of a mission partner, for instance. And you like that because then you have a need that you can meet. Can you see how that's an external motivation? I'm not saying it's a bad one. (laughs) We like when we bring needs to you and and you pray and and hear God and give. That's all good. But I'm just drawing attention to the fact this is not God. God is not motivated externally. He already is grace. And his grace flows out of him and toward us very naturally. I sometimes say it's his settled, eternal disposition for us. And it's one of pure love and devotion. Well, Paul also tells us that this grace has appeared. This grace has appeared. Now, we could say his, we know that God's grace has appeared even from the foundations of the earth, right? Last night it rained, this nice, gentle, long rain. I'm hoping the farmers uh, really enjoyed that. I enjoyed it even for my little garden and lawn. That was very needed. Um, That's a grace, a sustaining grace of God to his creation. That's not really what he's talking about here, the appearing of grace. It's far beyond that. It's certainly true to say that his grace is on display in so many wondrous ways. But it's not merely the evidence of a gracious God. It is a gracious God himself that we see. That is the appearance. And there's a second appearance that I read of, not only the one in Verse 11, that the grace of God has appeared, but also we find it in verse 13, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So these are two events, historical events, that Paul is alluding to. One being the first coming of Christ, the other being the second coming of Christ. And we're living in between. And Paul's going to help us in that living out, in that waiting period. Well, Jesus' first coming and his second coming uh, in the person of Jesus Christ is the very, as we know, the incarnate Son of God. God's grace perfectly made manifest. God's grace perfectly made manifest. 
And this idea that the life of Christ is the very appearance of the very grace of God rests on this belief that Jesus Christ has this unique relationship to God. He is, in fact, God the Father. We could turn to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was both with God and was God. And, of course, we know when we get down to verse 14 that this is the same Word that is made flesh and dwelt among us. We read it at Christmas time. We think of it because of the incarnation, the wonders of Christ coming to earth, the Word made flesh. And so this appearing is this marvelous event in history, this cataclysmic event where God himself comes on the scene. And it's important because through all of human history, humans, you can't detach humans from human worship. All humans are worshipers. Calvin famously said that our hearts are idol factories, and we are either going to you know, to quote uh, a modern-day poet, <laughs> Bob Dylan, you're going to serve somebody. It's going to be the Lord or it's going to be the devil. You're going to serve somebody. You are worshiping something at all times. And so um, before Christ came, in a way, man was groping in the dark for God. In fact, I was thinking this week of Paul's ministry to Athens. And when he walks through that city, he's... he's so excited to be in Athens, it's his first time there, and yet he arrives and he's so grieved in his heart for the 10,000 idols and temples that he sees. And, and by the end of chapter 17, then, he's, he's ministering to, at the Areopagus to the, to the great men of the city. And uh, he, he says this, uh, I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship and even found an altar on which was inscribed To an unknown God, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Well, that's the privilege that we have now, this side of the incarnation, that uh, we don't need to sort of read between the lines of human history to try to find God. We don't even, as evident as he is in nature, we don't even have to read the tea leaves of nature to find God. We can point back to an historic event the incarnation where we see this is our God. In fact, this is the God. This is God himself, God incarnate, the word made flesh. And so, grace, grace has appeared. Grace, though, we also see saves. If you read the second part of verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. I'll just spend probably one or two minutes just to make sure that we're not believing Paul is suddenly a universalist. So I think that is a very a good translation. It is what uh, the Greek says, bringing salvation to all people. Paul, though, clearly isn't a universalist. We, we know that um, not all people, we, even in the time of Christ, some rejected him. Uh, so Paul's not advancing that. I want to say that there's this difference, an important distinction to be made between bringing salvation to all people and salvation being received by all people. That's a really important distinction. Now, I think what this verse does say is many different encouraging things about the nature of God's grace, his salvation grace. Uh, One would be, uh, I think of our call to go and to preach the gospel to all creation. So we are not to be discriminate in terms of who to whom we preach this saving grace. Uh, we are to bring that to all people. So there's no limit in terms of the reach of our, um, of our preaching, the good news of God's saving grace. Uh, God, uh, in his word, he says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So again, that sense of a limitless grace. Theologians make, I think, an important distinction between saying there's a limitless potential, but there is a limited effect. All right, a a limitless potential, but a limited effect of God's grace, saving grace. Besides limitless in potential, though, grace itself is bottomless. Um, The fact that uh, I I am very needy, 
All right, I have no problem saying that. I wouldn't have said that when I'm 25, I can assure you of that, because I didn't see myself as being very needy, even as a Christian. Uh, but I am needy, and I need a big dosage of God's grace on a daily basis. And the fact that I am so greedy for his grace and needy for his grace doesn't disadvantage any of you sitting there this morning. And so I get my big dollop of grace this morning. I, I go to his uh, uh, throne of, of grace and mercy to find grace and mercy to help in time of need. And guess what? I leave there. You can come, and there's no less available for you. Is that good news? <laughs> Yeah, his grace is sufficient, not just for Paul, not just for me, but for all of us. So it's limitless in that way, bottomless. It's also, though, I guess, a, a limitless in terms of its um, ability to save the worst of us. You know, Paul uh, said that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And so as sin reigned in death, Grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So great promises that no matter how deep your sin feels, there is a grace that is deeper still. All right, so it's limitless in that sense as well. All of these things I'm reviewing, it's not because I think it's new to you, but it's because you need to hear it. I need to hear it. Why do we enjoy the Psalms? Pastor Andrew's been going through the Psalms on Wednesday. We covered some of our favorite Psalms on Friday. And we're, we're mining out of it these rich treasures of God's character and his, his, um, his attributes because we need to be reminded of them regularly. All our hearts are frail. Uh, some of you might have 25 or even younger year old hearts and you might not realize how much you need it. Um, but you do, all of us. Sin crouches at every one of our doors, and, um, and so we need God's grace. We need it to live. We need it to live for him. And so when we remind ourselves, when we think of this appearing as being the most stupendous thing that has ever happened, then I think we have a greater regard for it. And Paul wants us to be in mind of the mercies of God. Why? because then we'll appropriate them not only for ourselves, but we'll walk in those same mercies. And so we will see others as an object of this very same gospel of grace as ourselves. I don't know about you, but that my tendency, certainly as a human, was not to be that way. I was quick to judge and slow to grant grace. <clears throat> All right. God's grace saves. Um, I wonder, though, if Paul wasn't also, though, thinking of um, the rightful sense, I think, of Christian humility that comes on every heart that is truly touched by God's grace. Paul called himself, as I said, the chief of all sinners. And, you know, he's not exaggerating. He's not simply making a rhetorical point. He's not trying to be poetic or even falsely humble, I think it is truly the reflection of a man with a tender conscience. He's full of the reality of his faults and his, his frailties, his failures even, but he's also full of the reality of God's gracious forgiveness in his life, his steadfast love, his acceptance. And so Paul says to himself, you know, if God's, gracious, as, if God's grace is sufficient for me, then it is going to be sufficient for all. And like the hymn, this, this is a great old hymn, Jesus, the name high over all. Oh, that the world might taste and see the riches of his grace. The arms of love that compass me would all mankind embrace. Is that our heart's desire? I'm, I'm sure it is at least at an intellectual level, but, but can I challenge you to think of those ways in which you look at others, look at those, whether it's those that you love or those that you work with, those who are your neighbors. And we're talking about adorning the gospel. Is this your longing to see this grace that has grabbed you, rescued you, be embraced by somebody else as well? Does this mark us, this kind of humility mark us, where we're so mindful of the mercies that we require, 
not only to get saved, but to keep saved, if you will, um, that somebody else needs to be, I need to see them as the object of God's desire and God's grace as well. Now, I think this humility uh, is a natural consequence. So if, if you're, God is checking your heart and it's maybe something that uh, he wants you to work on, I do think it's a natural consequence of really truly embracing God's grace. You know, if there's one word that I would say summarizes the distinctiveness of the Christian faith, it would be grace. It would be grace. <clears throat> it's the fundamental question, really, of our lives as to how we humans, we know we're faulty. I think every language on the face of the earth probably has the expression, no one's perfect. And so we know that deep down inside. And so how do we reconcile ourselves with God? That is a fundamental question we face. Where did I come from? How I, how I ought to live? I've got a creator. How am I to live for him? <clears throat> and we know that we mess up. And so this is the fundamental question. Uh, some try to answer it in denying the reality of sin and evil. Uh, but that's, of course, not coherent at all with how we live and how we see others living. We just know that doesn't square with the truth. And so it really leaves our... It, it, the best it can do is numb our hearts, but it leaves our hearts unsettled with God, undealt with. The balance, they'll deal with it generally by, you know, they'll acknowledge sin, but they'll, they'll deal with it by either having sufficient good works to work out the balances of life so that God accepts them, or they just believe that God is so gracious and loving that he can turn a blind eye. Surely that is, you know, if he is forgiveness and love, he, he can just forgive me. Um, but all this does, really, is, is create this, um, a religious system of works, what Christians call works. Um, and so we, we go on this self-justification uh, project to make ourselves right before God. And the only outcomes possible from a self-justification project are despair or pride. You're either going to be prideful in your religious efforts, and that keeps your hard heart before the Lord, or you're in utter despair because you can't even keep your own laws, let alone a holy God. And so you, there's no system that you could put into place that you can obey and then be right with God. And so, thankfully, the Christian doctrine of grace tells us that we don't make ourselves right with God. It's God that does it for us. And God's grace is not... Uh, cheap. It is not ignoring sin. God's grace is that he was the one that took the penalty that our sin required. That is God's grace. In fact, we see this rooted in verse 14. You could turn your eyes there. Paul says of Jesus that he gave himself for us. This idea of Jesus being that substitute for us. He is our substitute. That substitute of uh, that, it, that is God's gracious act toward us, that on the cross, he was both exercising justice and mercy because he penalized sin and yet forgave us. Now, this is really hard for us as humans. It really is because we want to be able to say we earn things. We love to be able to say, I did it. Don't you love doing that? <laughs> I did it. I just recently made a little fence at the front of the property, and yeah, I'm probably kind of proud of it. It looks pretty good. Um, we love to be able to say, I did it. Uh, but uh, that is actually completely the opposite of grace. And uh, Martin Luther, I think, had a pithy little quote. A lot of quotes are attributed to Luther, but uh, you know, it's, hard not to do a preach on, or it's hard to do a preach on grace and not quote from Luther. He says, if God were willing to sell his grace, we would accept it more quickly and gladly than when he offers it for nothing. And sadly, that's so true. I know this is my heart even. Uh, there was a time in my life when, you know, early in my career, um, I uh, had an opportunity. I had a good friend who was looking to do some fitness. I liked racket sports. He had more money than I did. He was happy to take me out. We went out to play squash at a club. He paid my way. And I'm ashamed to admit it. It was probably a mere five bucks. <laughs> 
he would have been willing to do that every week. So like I said, we liked each other, and he wanted to get fit. Um, I couldn't go the second time because I didn't want to feel obligated to him for that five bucks. That's just pride for me not to be able to receive a gift, a gift my friend was more than willing to give. Now, if you think that that doesn't impact your life in some way, I'd ask you to really ask the Holy Spirit to, to, to move upon you and show you the ways in which you are reluctant to receive of the gracious gifts that God has for you. It's, you're human, just like I am. So the grace of God has appeared, and the grace of God brings salvation. What it also, though, does is train. This is a relentlessly practical little book in three chapters, and we already alluded to the fact that it's an appeal to godliness on several fronts. And so even though there's really interesting and deep theology, these four verses or five verses are, are amazingly deep, and, and we could really teach and lecture for hours on them. But we're going to find um, that Paul, though, is also relentlessly rooting this theology in practice. That's why we've called it gospel thinking for gospel living. Gospel believing for gospel behaving. Last, year, last week, Pastor Andrew talked about uh, character and conduct. Um, doctrine and duty, I think is what you said. Doctrine and duty. And, and so, if we divorce the, the good doctrine from our duty, then we are going to be in danger of, the, of another works-oriented salvation. And so Paul walks a very interesting and fine line here. So we're not merely about what we believe, but we're also not merely about what you do. God's grace saves, but God's grace also trains. For the grace of God, we see this in, at the end of uh, 11 and 12. For the grace of God had appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. All right, so there's a, this great uh, gospel announcement, if you will, of the grace of God having appeared. We could turn to 14, as I already have, and, and where he outlines that substitutionary uh, grace of the gift of Christ at the cross, uh, giving himself for us. Um, but we are trained in, we're seeing two ways. Trained uh, to renounce and trained to live. Trained to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. But it's not just the negative, there's a positive side as well. That there's a training in godliness. There's a training for right living, to be self-controlled, upright, and godly. And when... So often we think of the promises of God in, in the area of salvation as being future orientated, that we have that eternal hope in heaven. Peter talks about it, uh, that hope that is uh, our living hope kept in heaven, guarded by God himself. That's a wonderful promise. And Paul speaks to that a little bit here, if we have time for that. But, but he grounds this actually in this present age. In this present age, he wants us to know that what you believe is he's calling us to behave in a way that is commensurate or in concert with what we believe. And so there's both a positive and negative exhortation to this. Uh, the, the word that the ESV says is training. Some, you might have teaching. I think training is a better word, but even that, it fails to capture everything. This is really about God's sanctification project in our lives. It's not the mere giving of instruction. It's also this corrective action that the Lord has. Um, he who loves, he chastens. There's an element of chastening here, I think, with training, uh, disciplining of us by God through his word and by his spirit. Uh, it's not unlike uh, this, this idea of a, of a positive and negative of that we see throughout scripture of, of things that we have to uh, put on and put off. We, we have to reject the old man and uh, the old nature and put on the new, right? We have to, um, uh, we submit to God, resist the devil, as in James' words. So this is not unusual. There's this putting on, putting off. But what we find in the grace of God is that this is not merely some kind of Christian version of a world religion, a works orientation. Even 
this very putting on and putting off is fueled and empowered by the very grace of God. Uh, Paul notes this. It's, I have to go to Galatians to find this, but it, Galatians 2.20 says, um, uh, Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is the appearing grace of God. Christ in me. And you can say the same thing that Paul says. Christ is in you. It's not you who live, but Christ who lives in you. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. John also wrote along these lines of of the empowering work of God, his sanctifying work by his power. When he said the Spirit guides, you could say that's sort of like training, training us toward us, uh, t- training us toward all truth. Peter said his divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things that pertain to our life, sometimes I'll say it, our life and his godliness. So we're not left to our own devices, right? We're not left to our own devices. The purpose of this training, this purpose of this um, uh, grace fueled and motivated training is that we would be on the positive side live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And this, we could say, then, is really the design of the appearing of this grace. That word appearing is, is not, uh, we, it's, uh, what we get the word epiphany from. Epiphany, revelation, the revelation of the grace of God in Christ. The reason behind its appearing, its saving, its training is that we would live these self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Self-controlled, and that's what we owe ourselves. We owe ourselves to live that way. Upright, we owe that to society. And godly, we owe that to God. And I was thinking of just how precious this means we are to God. You know, I've heard you know, Richard Dawkins talk about the, the pettiness of God because he cares about the little things you do, your character and what you do in your conduct. To me, I'm so humbled by that, that, that God would care so much about what I do, that he'd not only call me to do that. Like, if you're a child and your parent never calls you to account for something, that could be that they don't think much of you. <laughs> Sorry to say but a you know, parent that actually demands something of you, that's because they believe you've got the, the power within you to do it. That's giving you respect. And so, so God calls us to, but he also empowers us. He's not simply calling us to a standard. He, he empowers the very walking out of that standard. So how precious we are to God. You know, Jesus gave himself to redeem you and to purify you for himself. For his own possession, Paul writes, zealous for good works. And this is the wonderful irony, isn't it, of the Christian life, that though we're not created by good works, we're created for good works. And too often, I think we we neglect neglect this as evangelical Protestants. Um, You know, I was thinking, I didn't mention this in the first, I thought afterward of 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 a good example. We were talking about adorning the gospel by our lives, by having our behavior be in such a way that not only does it align with what we, what we believe it ought to, but it adorns, it adorns the very gospel. What a privilege. Well, our lives, I've got a little telescope at home, and it's, it's very modest, but even my little modest telescope, I'm not looking directly at the stars. Do you realize that astronomers do not look directly at stars when they study them? They're actually looking into a mirror that reflects the stars above. And this is who we are, that we are to reflect, that our reflection of the very image of God, we know it's not going to be perfect, but it ought to bear enough resemblance that it's recognizable, that when they are looking with their naked eyes at the dim, faint stars in the sky, they see a resemblance. So, you know, they see the image of our creator, of our God, by the way we live our lives. That's our privilege and our joy as Christians. And so this appearing of grace does ultimately lead to the glory, of course, of his reappearing. But in between, we're called to wait, but it's not this passive wait. We're to be zealous, we're to be zealous for 
good works. And that is the job then of this training grace, this not only the appearing grace, the saving grace, but this training grace to prepare us, to help us to walk out those good works that God has preordained for us. Uh, and this is how we then adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ for the glory of God and the benefit of our community.